I invite you to ask one of the most powerful questions we can ask when we're managing landscapes, which is why. In this case, and in this section, we're going to talk about why do you have pests, weeds, and diseases. And I'm going to give you a clue. It's not due to a deficiency in herbicides or pesticides. In this example, uh, this is from a particular golf course in Western Australia. And as you can see on the soil on the left-hand side, the root systems are not going below a, an inch in depth and they shear off like a total like straight line. This has all sorts of implications for traffic, for swinging a golf club, you're just gonna dig into these soils. Um, and what they discovered in this process was they had six and a half thousand sting nematodes in a cup of soil. And they had been applying nematicides every single week with no effect as you can see it was costing them around a million dollars a year to manage these grounds and they were basically just I call it chasing your tail uh, the photo on the right hand side is what these soils look like after a year of compost applications you can see already that those roots are able to get down deep we're seeing a mixing through that profile um, and yeah getting on top of those nematodes which was pretty cool so they applied 30,000 pounds an acre of a fungal diverse compost and then uh, with every pass and every time they were out applying anything they were adding a compost extract and I really recommend that you look at doing something like this if you can improve the um, quality of the compost that you're finding, get some really good fungal biodiverse compost and turn that into an extract. That can be your water carrier for every single other action that you're taking on the property and just start to think, all right, I'm going to be stimulating microbiology instead of how do I kill those microbes? So insect and disease pressure relate directly or indirectly to soil health and nutrition. I'm not kidding, right? As we improve soil health and nutrition, we see a reduction in these types of pressures. So there's two meters that you could look at using. Um, that's either your SAP pH, you could also use a nitrate meter and your refractometer or your bricks meter. Send off leaf samples and do sap testing to identify any potential mineral imbalances and look at how can I do foliars perhaps in the transition so that I'm lifting plant nutrition and so we're not seeing those same insect and disease pressures so that you can drop the nematicides or drop the fungicides or the pesticides um, and support plant health while you're doing this. So one of the strategies to overwhelm diseases may be to be applying beneficials, microbial foods and nutrition. So putting beneficial type organisms down like trichoderma, feeding a diversity of microbiology through your humic acids, your kelp, your compost extracts, so that we can really see these kind of results. So like on the left hand side, we have a lot of disease pressures and on the right hand side, just you can see the line where the spray went is we aren't seeing those same disease pressures. As a result, we see um, we can profitably reduce our disease pressures. We see an improvement in those surfaces and your water relations are also going to improve. So get really curious about what a specific disease may be indicating to you. There's a really good book called Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease. Take a look at this one. It actually pulls apart what kind of mineral um, deficiencies relate to what kind of diseases. So for instance, a deficiency in zinc relates to pythium and viruses. Um, a deficiency in phosphorus could relate again to pythium. Um, manganese, so deficiencies in manganese, which are often induced by the use of glyphosate because the glyphosate binds to your manganese, uh, results in take all patch. Um, and then if we have an excess of nitrogen, we can actually see uh, nematodes and root rot diseases starting to show up. So get curious about what some of these mineral imbalances are doing and how that's actually creating a driving force for some of the diseases that you might be seeing. So part of my approach really is to look at that um, hierarchy of needs. So we go sunlight, air, water, decomposition, and nutrient. But I also look through this in terms of my five M's. So my five M's ask the question of what is it that's really causing the issue with why don't, why am I catching lots of uh, photosynthesis? Why have I got compaction? Why have I got water repellency? And we ask that question through the five M's. So the five M's are mindset, management, 
minerals, microbes, and organic matter, which is kind of an M, I'm kind of cheating, but that's all right. So we have these five M's and they dictate what's the outcome. So if we were to take um, a disease, for instance, how is it that my mindset is affecting um, the diseases that are showing up? So it's using this mindset piece that's so important. Um, how does that interplay with maybe what the diseases are that are showing up? How does your management affect potential diseases? Is there something that's going on with spray timing, nutrient timing, usage of those particular areas? Is there a major mineral imbalance? Perhaps you do have an excess of nitrates or an excess of potassium or a deficiency in phosphorus, whatever that might be. How does that mineral play into what's showing up? Either in, it could be in pests, weeds, or diseases, right? Low organic matter can be a really big driver for all of these factors. So it's one of those buffers in terms of let's build organic matter and we start to see more and more resilience in the system. <laughs> And in this section, I want to talk to you about insect pests, right? What's fascinating about insect pests is they actually avoid your complete proteins, right? They are attracted to what we call incomplete amino acids. And there's been quite a lot of research here in the US to show that if you feed insects complete proteins, um, high bricks, high nutrition, um, pasture, or any kind of plants, they will have a reduced ability to breed they lay less eggs, and then the eggs that actually hatch, those juveniles are smaller. They will choose not to eat nutrient-dense forage as a herbivore. They're attracted to plants that are stressed. They're attracted to plants that have some kind of issues. So if you look at this um, graph, what it's showing you is um, insect pressure is basically relates to zero means there's no insects in this situation, five means high very high insect pressure. And what you'll see is as the bricks comes up, down comes those insect pressures, right? It's actually detrimental to an insect to be eating on high bricks forage. Um, and this is one of the best visual examples I've seen of that. So I was just driving along one day um, and there had been a very, very dry summer in the Hawke's Bay in 2012. And we'd been out mustering sheep on horseback and what was moving in front of the sheep was this wall of black and what they were were mole crickets and so in this image you can see how um, this is fall or autumn so we're getting that flush of growth and the crickets have come up out of those cracks and they're eating that pasture down to the crowns uh, and doing absolutely horrendous amount of pasture damage. Now what's really interesting is that that damage stops on the fence line. That there's a difference that's happening between above the fence and below the fence in terms of nutrition that's no longer attracting our insect pests. <laughs> 